So far we have dealt with the epsilon delta definition, which states that if a function tends towards the limit L, then this is equivalent to the statement that for whatever value of epsilon that you choose, I can always find a value for delta such that if x is close enough to c, then this implies that f of x will be close enough to L. So a question remains, what if there is another number, m, that also satisfies this definition? So m is a number that's different from L that also satisfies this definition. So what I'm saying is that what if there is another number, m, that is distinct from L that also fits the epsilon delta definition? So that if x is close enough to c, then this implies that f of x will be close enough to m. So if there does indeed exist a number m that also satisfies the definition, is it even still meaningful for us to talk about this definition? Because this implies that this limit over here is not unique. So what I'm going to do in this video is to show you that if there does indeed exist a number m that also satisfies this definition, then it must be the case that l is equal to m. So in other words, the limit l has to be unique. So this is what I'm going to prove in this video. So in order to prove L is equal to M, one way to do this is to prove L minus M is equal to zero. So L and M are two numbers that satisfy the epsilon delta definition. And now I want to prove that this term is equal to zero. And I can do this by first subtracting F of X and then adding F of X to this term. So I get something like this. And then now I'm going to invoke the triangle inequality, which states that the absolute value of A plus B is smaller than or equal to the absolute value of a plus the absolute value of b. So this entire term over here is smaller than or equal to l minus f of x plus f of x minus m. So I just applied the triangle inequality directly. And then instead of f of x minus l, I can always rewrite this as f of x minus l. And you can see that both of these terms are completely identical to this term inside the epsilon delta definition. And I know that I can make these two terms arbitrarily small as long as x is sufficiently close to c. So if I restrict x to be sufficiently close to c, I can make these two terms arbitrarily small. So that means this entire term could be made arbitrarily small. So what we know so far is that we know that l minus m is always smaller than f of x minus l plus f of x minus m. And this applies for all values of x. And if x is made sufficiently close to c, I can ensure that this entire term can be made arbitrarily small. And even if this term is arbitrarily small, I know that this inequality will still hold. So the only situation in which L minus M will still be smaller than this arbitrarily small term is when L minus M is equal to zero. So that's the idea behind our proof. We prove that this term over here can be made arbitrarily small. And since this inequality must still hold, the only case in which this is possible is when L is equal to M. So that's the basic idea behind our proof. And next, I will show you the mathematical details behind how we can make these two terms arbitrarily small. So right now, our goal is to make f of x minus l and f of x minus m arbitrarily small. And we can do that by using the fact that both l and m satisfy the epsilon delta definition. So for whatever value of epsilon I can come up with, I know that, first of all, there exists a number delta 1 such that if x minus c is smaller than delta 1, then this implies that f of x minus l is smaller than epsilon over 2. So you might be wondering why I'm dividing epsilon by 2. Uh, this will eventually make our proof look nicer, and it's actually perfectly valid for me to divide this by 2, because I can make this value here arbitrarily small, and I sh there should still always exist a number delta, such that this entire conditional statement is true. So that's the idea behind the epsilon delta definition. So I can always divide this by two, make this term smaller, and I know that there will still always exist a value delta one such that this entire conditional statement is true. So it's perfectly valid for me to divide this by two. And then I can do the same thing for m. So I know that there exists a number delta two such that f of x minus m is always smaller than epsilon over two. So now I'm going to define another number called delta that's equal to the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2. So since delta is the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2, if x 
is within a distance of delta away from c, I know that this will imply that both f of x minus l and f of x minus m must be smaller than epsilon over 2. So both of these terms will be smaller than epsilon over 2. And it's because delta is the minimum of these two terms. So that's why both of these conditions will be satisfied. So that's why I know f of x minus l and f of x minus m must both be smaller than epsilon over 2. So going back here, now we know that for whatever value of epsilon you come up with, we can always define a value of delta in such a way so that when x is within a distance of delta away from c, then both of these terms will be smaller than epsilon over 2. So both of these terms will be smaller than epsilon over 2 if x is within a distance of delta away from c. And you can see that both of these combine together to give you an epsilon. So for whatever value of epsilon that you can come up with, there will always exist a value of delta, such that if x is within a distance of delta away from c, then l minus m is smaller than epsilon. So that means l minus m will always be smaller than whatever value of epsilon you can come up with. And so the only situation in which this inequality will still hold in such a situation is when l minus m is equal to zero. So you can imagine if l minus m is not equal to zero, let's say l minus m is equal to 0 0.1, you will see that I can always come up with an epsilon that can violate this inequality. But we know that this inequality must always be true. So it must be the case that l minus m is equal to zero because this epsilon can be arbitrarily small. And so this essentially concludes the proof. So L minus M must be equal to zero. And so that means L must be equal to M. And so this proves that the limit must be unique.